Good evening, everyone. Welcome to class. Just let me know if I am audible and visible and you are able to see the presentation so that we can start. Yeah, I hope I'm audible and visible. Okay, thank you. So see today uh, we are having another session of MCQs. And in today's session, I thought that we will do a quick run through of the important one liners in ophthalmology for whatever exam that you are preparing for, but mainly for NEET PG because uh, the because of the type of questions that have been coming maybe in the last say uh, one year one and a half years or so the focus is completely shifted to image based and clinical case scenario based questions but somehow i feel that one-liners never lose their importance and in the last one inict we saw that we did have a substantial number of one-liners and in this process of going through clinical and image based and case scenario based questions somehow i feel that we are not discussing one -liners liners enough and one liners if we miss even one of them it's actually a huge loss so in today's session we will just go through the important one liners in ophthalmology and along with that i will discuss the other one liners which which can be discussed taking the opportunity of these questions so let us start off so what is the epithelium of the cornea the epithelium of the cornea is Cuboidal epithelium, columnar epithelium, stratified squamous keratinized epithelium, stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. So which one should we mark here? What is the epithelium of the cornea? Correct. Very good. It is the stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. And actually, it is not just the epithelium of the cornea. It is both the epithelium of the cornea and the conjunctiva. Or we should say that it is the epithelium of the ocular surface. The epithelium of the ocular surface is a stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. Now, a few other important things to remember from here. Stree, see, when there is a vitamin A deficiency or there is xerophthalmia, then what happens is that this stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium of the ocular surface, it gets converted to a stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. This is also an important one-liner. Right. So normally the epithelium of the ocular surface is stratified squamous non-keratinized and in xerophthalmia or vitamin A deficiency, the stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium undergoes metaplasia and becomes a stratified squamous keratinized epithelium. And also another thing to remember from here, will anybody be able to tell me what is the epithelium of the crystalline lens? All of you know that the crystalline lens has got an anterior epithelium. So what is the epithelium of the crystalline lens? Will anyone tell me? What is the epithelium of the crystalline lens? This is also an important one liner. Okay, let me tell you, the epithelium of the crystalline lens, centrally, it is a cuboidal epithelium. Centrally, we have cuboidal epithelium and peripherally, this epithelium becomes a little elongated and it becomes a columnar epithelium. So, please remember this also. So, epithelium of the crystalline lens, there is only an anterior epithelium, there is no posterior epithelium and centrally, we have slightly I mean flatter cells so we have cuboidal epithelium and the same cells as they move towards the periphery they become elongated and then that's called as a column okay so so much to learn from this one question so let me take you to the next question where do we get to see Horner tranta spots the options given to us are flictenular conjunctivitis vernal keratoconjunctivitis trachoma adenoviral conjunctivitis so, where do we get to see this? Simple question. Correct. We get to see this in VKC, that is spring keta. The other name for VKC, all of you know, this is spring keta. So, what are the important names or one-liners to remember 
from VKC. See, in VKC, if you lift the upper tarsal conjunctiva, the appearance of the conjunctiva, that's called as cobblestone appearance. So, cobblestone appearance is seen in VKC. Horner trantar spots are seen close to the upper limbus. And does anyone remember what's the name of the ulcer, the corneal ulcer that is associated with VKC? The name of the ulcer that is seen in VKC? It is shield ulcer, shield ulcer. So see cobblestone appearance, shield ulcer, HD spots. All these are seen in VKC, vernal keratoconjunctivitis. Now suppose I ask you, where do you get to see Arlt's line and Herbert Spitz? We have the same options. Which one will you mark? Arlt's line and Herbert Spitz. These are also important one-liners. Where do you get to see them? If we have the same options, which one will you mark? Arts line and Herbert Spitz, correct. Arts line and Herbert Spitz are seen in trachoma. So, Arts line is seen on the upper tarsal conjunctiva. That is, if you lift the upper lid, you word the upper lid. And Herbert Spitz are seen close to the upper limbus, right? So, Arts line and Herbert Spitz, these are important one-liners from trachoma. Okay, so let's go to the next question. Tell me, where do you get to see Fleischer's ring? Fleischer's ring is seen in pterygium, keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration or granular dystrophy. Where do we get to see Fleischer's ring? Fleischer's ring is a pigmented ring due to iron deposition. Where do you get to see that? Very good. We get to see Fleischer's ring in keratoconus. So, in keratoconus, at the base of the cone, there is a pigmented ring due to iron deposition. And this is due to lack of normal spreading of the tear film. So, the tear film doesn't spread nicely over the, spread, over the surface of the cornea. And there is a deposition of iron at the base of the cone and that's called as Fleischer's ring. Similarly, there is another line that you get to see due to iron deposition and that's called as Stalker's line. Now, if we have the same options and I ask you where do you get to see Stalker's line, which option will you mark? Where do we get to see Stalker's line? Where do we get to see Stalker's line? Correct. Stalker's line is seen in pterygium. It is the pigmented line at the head of the pterygium due to iron deposition. So, both these, Fleischer's ring and Stalker's line, are basically because of iron deposition. Fleischer's ring is seen in K-conus at the base of the cone and Stalker's line is seen at the head of the pterygium. What is the expected refractive error in keratoconus? Do we get to see a hypermetropia, a simple hypermetropic astigmatism, an irregular myopic astigmatism or do we get to see a compound hypermetropic astigmatism? What do we get to see in keratoconus? Very good. What we get to see is an irregular myopic astigmatism. So, see, there is a myopia because there is a protrusion of the globe. So, the actual length is increased. But this protrusion, it is it is not the same in both the meridians. So, there is astigmatism and it follows no pattern. So, it's irregular. So, the refractive error in keratoconus is an irregular myopic astigmatism. And because of this irregular myopic astigmatism, if you do a retinoscopy, what is the name of the reflex that you get to see? This is also an important MCQ. On retinoscopy, the reflex that you get to see is called as the scissoring reflex, which is one of the very early signs of picking up keratoconus. So, because of this irregular astigmatism, there is a splitting of the retinoscopy reflex and that is called as scissoring reflex and this is one of the early signs that you get to see in keratoconus. Right? So, let's go to the next question. What is the drug of choice for HSV dendritic ulcer? So, what is the drug of choice? Is it topical steroids, topical acyclovir, systemic acyclovir or systemic steroids? What is the drug of choice for HSV dendritic ulcer? Very good. It is topical acyclovir. Very, very correct. So, see, the important thing to remember here is that dendritic ulcer and geographic ulcer. So, these two types of ulcers, the dendritic ulcer and geographic ulcer, these are two, two types of epithelial keratitis. These are epithelial HSV keratitis. Okay. And epithelial HSV keratitis is because of direct invasion of the epithelium by the virus and there is an actively replicating virus in an in a epithelial keratitis. So, there are two types of epithelial keratitis. There is dendritic ulcer and there is geographic ulcer. 
So because these are caused by an actively replicating virus, so that's why the treatment of choice is topical acyclovir and absolutely contraindicated in this case in a dendritic or a geographic ulcer absolutely contraindicated is topical steroids. You must not give topical steroids in HSV dendritic or geographic ulcer because they are caused by an actively replicating virus. However, because if you have other types of HSV keratitis, what are the other types? See, other types are you can have stromal keratitis, you can have disciform keratitis, or you can have endothelial keratitis. Now, these varieties that are there, that is stromal disciform and endothelial keratitis, these are caused by an immune reaction to the viral antigen. So, for these varieties of HSV keratitis, the drug of choice is topical steroids. So, please remember this. This is somewhere where students commonly go wrong. So, we have to remember this that for epithelial keratitis, that is for geographic ulcer and HSV keratitis, the drug of choice is topical acyclovir and absolutely contraindicated is topical steroids. Whereas for the other varieties that is stromal disciform and endothelial keratitis, which are caused by an immune reaction to the viral antigen, the drug of choice is topical steroids. Okay, Chal. let's go to the next one. Phacomorphic glaucoma is caused by, so the options of that we have are nuclear cataract, immature intumescent cataract, hypermature sclerotic cataract or hypermature morganian cataract. So which one will we mark? Phacomorphic glaucoma is caused by, so what is the answer that we should be marking here? Which type of cataract causes phacomorphic glaucoma? Okay, so see, phacomorphic glaucoma is caused by a mature intumescent cataract. So, please remember this, mature intumescent cataract. Intumescent cataract means what? It's a cataract which is swollen. So, it pushes the iris forward and it closes the angle and that is called as phacomorphic glaucoma. And as usual, a lot of students confuse it with phacolytic glaucoma. So, what is phacolytic glaucoma? In phacolytic glaucoma, this is caused by a hypermature morganian cataract. Now, here in a hypermature morganian cataract, there is a sunken nucleus. And the cortical matter above, this is liquefied. So, there is a sunken nucleus and there is liquefied cortex. And this liquefied cortex leaks out and blocks the pores of the trabecular meshwork. So, that is called as phacolytic glaucoma. So, phacomorphic glaucoma is caused by mature intumescent cataract and phacolytic glaucoma by a hypermature morganian cataract. And also another important thing to remember here is that phacomorphic glaucoma is a type of angle closure glaucoma. So, it's a secondary angle closure glaucoma, not primary. It's a secondary angle closure glaucoma, whereas phacolytic glaucoma, this is a secondary open angle glaucoma. So, phacomorphic is an angle closure glaucoma, whereas phacolytic, this is a secondary open angle glaucoma. Right? So, this is a question, it's a simple question, often asked question, but it's a question where a lot of students, I mean, it's a question where a lot of people go, go wrong. Right? So, I hope that you will not go wrong with this now. Let's go to the next one. Where do we get to see sunflower cataract? So, do we get to see it in diabetes, galactosemia, myotonic dystrophy or Wilson's disease? Very commonly asked question. Which, where do we get to see sunflower cataract? Sunflower cataract is typically seen in Wilson's disease. So, all of you know that Wilson's disease is because of the deposition of copper and the cataract that we see here, this is called as a sunflower cataract. This is called as a sunflower cataract. Now, just to quickly go over the other varieties, suppose I tell you snowflake cataract, which option will you mark out of these? Where do we get to see snowflake cataract? If we say snowflake cataract, which of these conditions, the same options, snowflake cataract is seen in correct diabetes. So, snowflake cataract, this is the typical description that is given to diabetic cataracts. Suppose I tell you oil droplet cataract, which one will you mark? 
oil droplet cataract oil droplet cataract which one will be marked Correct. Oil droplet cataract. The answer is galactosemia. Galactosemia. We have oil droplet cataract. And in myotonic dystrophy, I think all of you know this. This is called as a Christmas tree cataract. Christmas tree cataract that is seen in myotonic dystrophy. So to quickly go over the one-liners in this slide, sunflower cataract is seen in Wilson's disease. Snowflake cataract in diabetes. Oil droplet cataract in galactosemia and Christmas tree cataract is typically seen in myotonic dystrophy. Okay, now tell me where do we get to see rosette cataract? Another important one liner. Rosette cataract is seen in where do we get to see rosette cataract? Chalo, quickly recall karo, where do you get to see a rosette cataract? Correct. Rosette cataract is associated with blunt trauma. So, this is also an important one-liner. Rosette cataract, this is seen in blunt trauma. Correct? So, let's go to the next question. Where do we get to see posterior lenticonus? Posterior lenticonus is seen in Alport's, Downs, Lowy syndrome or myotonic dystrophy. So, which one should we mark? Now, see, posterior lenticonus may be seen as an association in many conditions. But if we get this question, typically we are expected to mark Lowy syndrome. Lowy syndrome, this is what we are expected to mark. Now, see, posterior lenticonus it is associated with other conditions also. But typically, when we talk about posterior lenticonus, we talk about Lowy syndrome. And that is why if we get this question in the exam, we will mark Lowy syndrome as our answer. So, if you search, you will find that posterior lenticonus is also seen in other conditions. Huh? So, it's not that it is only seen in Lowy's. But typically, the typical type of posterior lenticonus, it is described here. So, we mark this as the answer. That's the only explanation for this. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Where do we get to see sauce and cheese retinopathy? Again, very commonly asked one-liner. Where do we get to see sauce and cheese retinopathy? Is it in toxoplasma retinochoroiditis, HSV retinitis, cytomegalovirus retinitis or sarcoidosis? Where do we get to see? Correct. Very good. Sauce and cheese retinopathy is seen in CMV retinitis. And there is also another name for this condition. It is also called as pizza pie retinopathy. So, sauce and cheese retinopathy, pizza pie retinopathy, they are all the same thing. There are areas of retinal whitening and hemorrhages. So, there is white and there is red. So, there are areas of retinal whitening and there is also associated retinal hemorrhages. So, this appearance of white and red, this is called as sauce and cheese retinopathy or pizza pie retinopathy. Okay. Now, suppose we are asked this question, where do you typically get to see headlight in fog appearance? What will you mark? Headlight in fog appearance, which one will you mark? Headlight in fog appearance is actually dense vitritis associated with retinochoroiditis. So, there is a dense vitritis with retinochoroiditis which is called that. Correct. This is typically the description of toxoplasma, active toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. So, headlight in fog appearance is toxoplasma retinochoroiditis, sauce and cheese retinopathy or pizza pie retinopathy is seen in cytomegalovirus retinitis. Okay. Chalo. Let's go to the next question. A bilateral granulomatous anuveitis with vitiligo and tinnitus. Where is this seen? This typical description where you have a bilateral granulomatous anuveitis with vitiligo and tinnitus. Where do you get to see this? Correct. This is typically the description for VKH disease. VKH stands for Vogt Koyanagi Harada disease. Vogt Koyanagi Harada disease and VKH is typically described as oculoneurocutaneous disease. So, there are ocular features, neurological features and cutaneous features. As you can see here, see bilateral granulomatous pan uveitis is ocular, vitiligo is cutaneous is cutaneous, tinnitus and encephalopathy. These are these are associated with neurological tinnitus. Apart from vitiligo, you can also have alopecia and you can have poliosis. So, vitiligo, alopecia and poliosis, these are our cutaneous features. 
it in, in it is an encephalopathy these are the neurological features and bilateral granulomatous and uveitis these are the ocular features so these are the features of vkh disease vogt koyanagi harada disease right so let's go to the next question what is the drug of choice for uveitis? Now, this is a very simple question, but I don't know why a lot of students have confusion in this question. So, tell me what is the drug of choice for uveitis? Which one should be marked? The options given to us are atropine, steroids, antibiotics, anti -vegis. Yeah, make no mistake about this. The drug of choice for uveitis is steroids. Because until and unless you give steroids, the uveitis will not resolve. Now, atropine, this is an adjuvant. Atropine must be given, but this is given as an adjuvant because it is a cycloplegic. It relieves the ciliary spasm and therefore relieves the pain. So, it helps to relieve uveitis is always associated with a whole lot of ciliary spasm and this ciliary spasm is the cause of pain. So, therefore, the purpose of atropine is to relieve the pain not to relieve the uveitis. The uveitis is not going to be affected by giving atropine. So, the drug of choice, if we want to the uveitis to resolve, you always have to give the steroids. So, depending upon how severe the uveitis is, it can either be topical steroids or it can be steroids by a posterior subtenin injection or it can be systemic steroids or it can even be a systemic immunosuppressant. But it has to be some form of steroid or immunosuppression Atropine is not the drug of choice for uveitis. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Where do we get to see dalen fuchs nodules? dalen fuchs nodules, these are typically described in sympathetic ophthalmitis, BKH disease, ankylosing spondylitis or sarcoidosis. Where do we get to see? Correct. dalen fuchs nodules, these are typically described in sympathetic ophthalmitis. Sympathetic ophthalmitis, this is where we typically get to see dalen fuchs nodules. So, this is again a very commonly asked one-liner, where do we get to see dalen fuchs nodules? So, this is typically seen in sympathetic ophthalmitis. Okay, next question. Where do we get to see 100-day glaucoma? 100-day glaucoma is seen in CRAO, CRVO, retinitis pigmentosa, or Stargardt's disease. Where do we get to see 100-day glaucoma? Good. 100-day glaucoma, this is typically seen in CRVO, central retinal vein occlusion. Now, what essentially is this 100-day glaucoma? This is basically neovascular, end-stage neovascular glaucoma end stage neovascular glaucoma which is seen in crvo and typically this happens about 3 months after the onset of the venous occlusion so 3 months after the onset of the venous occlusion we get to see this neovascular glaucoma obviously if the patient is left untreated then you get to see this neovascular glaucoma roughly 3 months after the onset of the venous occlusion and therefore it is called as 100 day glaucoma some books will tell you 90 day glaucoma also right so, this is typically our 100-day glaucoma or 90-day glaucoma, which is seen in central retinal vein occlusion. Again, old one-liner, where do we get to see cattle track sign or it is also called as tram track sign? Cattle track sign or tram track sign. Where do we get to see this? CRAO, CRVO, retinitis pigmentosa or Stargardt's disease. Where do we get to see this? Cattle track sign. Correct. It is seen in CRAO, central retinal artery occlusion. So, this is basically segmentation of the blood column. This is segmentation or of the blood column in the occluded blood vessel. That's called as cattle track sign or tram track sign. Right? So, this typically we, in the, in the acute stage, the appearance is called as cherry red spot. That is, the retina is pale and only the fovea is bright red. This all of you know. Another important one-liner from here is tram track sign or cattle track sign. Okay, another old but commonly asked one-liner, where do we get to see Harb's dry? Where do we get to see Harb's dry? The options given to us are Bufthalmus, Keratoconus, Myopia, Trauma. Where do we get to see Harb's dry? 
Herbs triae are typically seen in Buphthalmus, that is congenital glaucoma. So, these are actually striae which are seen due to the stretching of the cornea. So, these herbs triae, we need to remember that they are seen in which layer of the cornea? Herbs triae, they are seen in the desmets membrane of the cornea. So, please remember herbs triae, these are seen on the desmets membrane of the cornea and typically they are horizontal in direction. So, we remember it as H for H. So, desmets, these are stretch lines on the desmets membrane or striae on the desmets membrane and they are typically horizontal in direction. And correct, the other type of corneal striae that we need to remember are the vogue striae. Now, vogue striae are also striae or stretch lines on the cornea which are seen in keratoconus. And this also is these are striae are seen on the decimates membrane here. But we have to remember the direction is vertical. So, for vogue striae, we remember it as V for V. They are vertical in direction. Whereas, half striae, we remember it as H for H. They are horizontal in direction. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Where do we get to see polychromatic luster? In which type of cataract do we get to see polychromatic luster? Is it cataract associated with blunt trauma, myotonic dystrophy? Is it a complicated cataract or nuclear cataract? Good. Polychromatic luster is typically described in complicated cataract. So, what is complicated cataract? It is cataract associated with other ocular diseases like uveitis, high myopia, angle closure glaucoma, intraocular tumors, etc. So, they are called as complicated cataract and they show this typical polychromatic luster and they also have a granular appearance which is called as breadcrumb appearance. So, this is also an old one-liner. At which, which type of cataract do we get to see breadcrumb appearance and in which type of cataract do we get to see polychromatic luster? The answer to both of them is complicated cataract. Okay, Chalo. let's go to the next question. What is the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in children? So, what is the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in children? The options given to us are thyroid ophthalmopathy, chloroma, orbital cellulitis, retinoblastoma. So, which one should be marked? What is the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in children? The answer is orbital cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis is the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in children. Now, remember the typical presenting feature of retinoblastoma is not proptosis. It is leukocoria. Leukocoria or white pupillary reflex, that is the presenting feature for retinoblastoma. So, retinoblastoma is an ocular disease and it doesn't present usually with proptosis. Proptosis is a very end stage feature of retinoblastoma. It presents with leukocoria, that is white pupillary reflex. So, proptosis is generally the presentation of some orbital disease. So, most common cause of proptosis in children is orbital cellulitis. That's unilateral proptosis. Now, suppose I ask you what is the most common cause of unilateral or bilateral proptosis in adult? What will you mark out of the same options? So, most common cause of unilateral or bilateral proptosis in an adult patient, which one will you mark? Correct. This everybody knows that is thyroid ophthalmopathy. So, please remember that thyroid is of course bilateral, but thyroid may start unilaterally. It may be asymmetrical. It's not necessary that both of them is going to have proptosis at the same time. So, the initial presentation of thyroid ophthalmopathy can be unilateral. So, that's why the most common cause of unilateral proptosis in an adult patient is also thyroid ophthalmopathy. So, most common cause of unilateral or bilateral proptosis in an adult patient is thyroid ophthalmopathy. Right? So, these are the questions that I had in store for you today. So, this was a quick session of revision of one-liners and I hope that this has been useful to all of you and we will be having a more, um, more sessions like this in future and I hope that you will be a part of those sessions also. So, uh, you can 
follow me on the an academy app those of you who are still not a part of our app so do download the app and you can start watching our special classes so see you can use this code that is my code doc sutha and you can start watching our special classes we will be having a lot of special classes the next month which will be for revision for neat pg so the you uh, we are having these interactive live classes with lots of polls which kind of help you to uh, to to answer questions and get into the habit of revising uh, the things that you've already learned and on this platform see we have this very unique feature which is the raise a hand feature which allows you to talk to the educators in your live classes and get your doubts resolved in real time so these are so do start watching the special classes you can use my code doc sudha for the same and those of you who want to enroll for the plus subscription which gives you access to both live and recorded plus classes and the opportunity to uh, learn from some of the top educators of our country you can use this code doc sudha and if you want to enroll for the iconic subscription which gives you access to the two platforms that is an academy and prep ladder then also you can use the same code right now see uh, our platform that is the plus platform also gives you access to this q bank which is highly updated and effective and has about 25000 high yield clinical questions based on the exam latest patterns and also it has detailed explanations so as i was telling you it is very important to learn the theory but at the same time it's also very important to revise revision and application is what makes you exam ready so answering these questions and using this q bank is is going to really help you in your presentations so i told you about the raise a hand feature and on this platform we are catering all our courses to exactly the type of exam that a student wants to prepare for so if you are preparing for the fmg uh, fmg exam in june we have the focus fmg 2022 batch if you are planning for the neat pg exam this march then we have this mcq discussion batch which is going to be a quick revision of all the 19 subjects through mcq discussions if we also are having an ultra fast revision batch which is going to be a a fast coverage a really fast coverage for a last minute revision with last minute tips for the neat pg 2020 so this is for our neat pg uh, subscription and also i wanted to tell you that today is like today we have this republic day special um, for the students who will be taking the plus subscription on these 3 days so 27th today today is the last day for this uh, for this uh, special offer and see this is another important thing that i want to tell you that is the free test calendar so every month we are having these these free tests we there are educator curated test series which are subject wise and then there are neat pg 2022 grand test and also fmg grand test so as i told you do it is really important to learn your theory to memorize it's also very important that you keep on applying them and see if your exam ready because learning to answer mcq is also an art that comes only with practice so i would encourage you to participate in as many tests as possible one for of course to see where you stand among your peers because there will be others also who will be taking taking the exam but more for a self assessment because you get to understand which are your weak areas where you need to study more or revise more right so thank you very much everyone for being a part of the session and i hope you will be uh, you will be a part of the of the other sessions also that we will be soon having on youtube and also on the unacademy app so thank you everyone bye bye and see you in the next class